Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and in the spirit of the trees, in the spirit of living nature, with deep gratitude to all of our ancestors who have brought us to the present moment, I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we convene our third of five day program on the Amazon and the NGO Pachamama Alliance that has been working for many, many years, not only to protect the Amazon, but also to bring the spirituality of the indigenous people in that part of the world uh, into the awareness of uh, the Western Northern uh, colonizers uh, so that we can uh, amend our ways and work together with them uh, in alignment uh, with Pachamama. Uh, with the Great Mother. And so we're uh, very uh, pleased to have this program. And I want to uh, set a context that just came across the wires uh, late yesterday so we understand the importance of what we're doing here as we protect the, the Amazon. Uh, the World Meteorological Organization, which is part of the United Nations uh, Network, uh, announced that uh, the extreme weather events around the uh, planet are getting increasingly severe and causing uh, roughly $200, $250 million of damage every 24 hours now. Uh, they reported that over the last 50 years, the number of extreme weather events have increased fivefold. And it wasn't one fold each 10 years, but rather a curve that's now going up. And uh, the Secretary General commenting on this report uh, said uh, uh, yesterday uh, that the world is now going into uncharted territory of destruction. Uh, we haven't paid any attention to what our climate scientists have told us now for the last 75 years. And we're now in code red. And we are now in an inevitability of escalating ecological uh, turbulence. When you combine that with the uh, turbulence that's happening uh, geostrategically with something like the war in Ukraine, uh, politically with the rising authoritarianism uh, that is now a global phenomenon, with economic and financial hardships, that are afflicting more and more people, uh, you have a world situation of escalating stress. Uh, the data is showing that in every country in the world, without exception, people are now more stressed. And all the indicators of stress, uh, crime, addiction, uh, domestic violence, uh, suicide, uh, depression, anxiety, road rage are all escalating worldwide. And in fact, uh, a group of scientists about a month ago said that the, as the COVID-19 pandemic recedes, although is still very present, the new pandemic is global stress. And I wanted to uh, frame our discussion today because we're gonna be talking about an emerging alliance uh, in the headwaters of the Amazonia uh, that are, is, is seeking to uh, ameliorate some of the uh, ecological damage there. But I also wanted to underscore that all of us are now in a situation where we have to take measures that may have been interesting and marginal just a few years ago, but are now essential to ensure our inner equilibrium and well-being. And that's why we have started uh, to bring in a coherent breathing practice uh, into humanity rising, uh, because it is a breathing practice that science uh, has been indicating as the scientists research more and more on the healing power of breath. There's a particular kind of breathing that optimizes all of your body systems, and in particular, your heart, brain, coherence, and the capacity of your inner 
ecosystem to maintain emotional and psychological equanimity. It's very important that we all take this in because as the chaos and turbulence externally continues to now take us into uncharted territories of destruction, as the Secretary General has said in the last 24 hours, commenting on the World Meteorological Organization's report of uh, escalating extreme weather events. Uh, we at Humanity Rising want to offer each day as we begin uh, a coherent breathing practice, which is very simple. You just breathe in for about five, five and a half seconds, and you breathe out for about five and a half seconds. Slow breathing in, slow breathing out. And we're going to do it for 15 breaths. And you'll just feel how your entire system starts to relax. And your sense of well being and calmness begins to take hold. And just imagine if the whole world would just be breathing together in a coherent way, the kind of radical changes that would take place would probably astonish us all. So we are bringing this coherent breathing practice. It's been developed by Steve Elliott. Uh, and I'll put the uh, YouTube link uh, in the chat box uh, for those of you who are joining us on the Zoom call uh, and announce it toward the end of the program. Uh, but this is a very important practice that we want to uh, include for our entire humanity rising uh, community. It takes about three minutes. Uh, and then after that, we'll commence our program. You'll see on the screen uh, a five-pointed star, and that is a depiction of the orbit of Venus, the planet Venus and the Earth as they circumnavigate the sun. They form a beautiful five-pointed star. The number of Venus is five. The number of the goddess Aphrodite, Ishtar, Inanna, uh, the major goddesses of antiquity were all five. They were all associated with the planet Venus. And this coherent breathing is to the count of five. So when you're breathing in, you're actually breathing in the mother. <laughs> you're breathing out the mother. You're breathing in Pachamama. You're breathing out Pachamama. And that's why it's such a powerful uh, breathing practice uh, for us all. Georg?
Thank you, everyone. You know, it's worth noting that most of the ancient chants, if you think of the Ava Maria in Latin or the Om Mani Padme Hum, uh, are all done to the 5.5 second in and 5.5 second out. So what we're offering out is not new. It's so ancient. It happened long before history was written. Uh, and science is only beginning to understand the profundity of these various types of coherent breathing. So I just want to note that, that this is very ancient. And because of its ancientness, it's ever, ever more powerful. So it's in the spirit of coherence, community, and compassion that I want to now introduce our program on the sacred headwaters of alliance there in the Amazon by bringing on Lynn Twist, uh, who with her husband and partner, Bill Twist, who's convened the sessions up to now, uh, were the co-founders along with John Perkins and others of the Pachamama Alliance that, as I indicated for uh, many decades since uh, 1996, uh, have been working with the uh, indigenous peoples there to both protect the Amazon and uh, uh, awaken further global spirituality by bringing the indigenous spirituality to our collective global attention. So, Lynn, uh, my good friend, uh, I welcome you and thank you for all that you and Bill and the Pachamama Alliance community have done to preserve the lungs of the earth and uh, to uh, uh, upgrade uh, global spirituality. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was wonderful. I. Um... Thank you so much for your introduction uh, to us, but also to um, this session and about the meteorology, meteorology, I can't say the word, the report <laughs> um, and the ramifications of that and that the next pandemic is global stress. That's a, a very powerful statement and beginning to this session. I And I just love the way you take whatever's coming through and create a context for it so we can be as responsible and as um, engaged uh, as possible as human beings. So, you know, just thank you, thank you, thank you, Jim Garrison. Um, so uh, I will begin by inter introducing um, uh, Atosa Sultani, who is, uh, uh, is gonna come on the screen now, hopefully. Uh, and she is the global strategist for the uh, Amazon Sacred Headwaters Alliance. Um, and um, this session is about the Amazon Sacred Headwaters. Um, uh, and we're going to talk about what the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Alliance is. And it is an indigenous led uh, alliance. It is the largest, as far as we know, indigenous led conservation effort on earth. And it is also uh, an, an indigenous led um, collaboration uh, of extraordinary uh, power and um, exceptional, uh, it's unfortunately very rare, but it's huge and very important. And in, it's a, in a place that is the most, most biodiverse ecosystem on planet Earth. And Atosa is the global uh, leader of it, strategist. Uh, she's also the chairman of the board of Amazon Watch, which she founded, uh, and Amazon Watch and the Pachamama Alliance, uh, which I co-founded with Bill, Bill Twist and John Perkins. Uh, we've worked very closely together in a particular region of the Amazon for many, many years. And um, one of the main indigenous groups that we've done that with is the Achuar people. And the Achuar people uh, are very uh, extraordinary uh, in their capacity to organize and inspire other indigenous groups to organize, to defend uh, the Amazon, defend their particular territory, but not just for themselves, but for the future of life. And so we also have with us today, and we're very fortunate to have Domingo Peaz, um, who is in Ecuador, as is uh, Atosa. Uh, that's the country where they're uh, beaming in from. And Domingo um, is, uh, understands a lot of English, but is going to be translated by another one of our colleagues, uh, Rafaela uh, Iturralde. So um, there's the four of us here <clears throat> that are going to be um, uh, engaging with all of you about the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative. 
Um, and um, and I'm going to just say, uh, give um, Atosa a chance to just say hello. And then I thought we'd start, it's okay with you, Atosa, with the film uh, that, that gives people a visual of where we're talking about uh, and where it's located on planet Earth and some of the challenges that we're um, we're meeting and facing. So Atosa, why don't you say a little something? Okay, hello. Thank you, Jim Garrison, for this invitation and the Humanity Rising team. Thank you, Lynn Twist. Um, it's great to be here. I look forward to sharing and also tra uh, translating for Domingo. Um, Jorge couldn't be with us. Jorge Perez, another indigenous leader, couldn't be with us today because of an emergency that arrived. Um, but I'm really excited to have this opportunity to share more about the rainforest in general, the Amazon in particular, and the Sacred Headwaters Initiative. So we'll be back after the film. Okay. And you'll see Domingo in the film, so then we'll have him speak afterwards. So um, let's see. Uh, Georg, can you run the film, The Amazon Sacred? It's about four and a half minutes. Please mute yourself to avoid feedback. Thank you. The Amazon River Basin houses the planet's largest tropical rainforest, covering an area the size of the continental United States. Often called the lungs of the Earth, the Amazon rainforest generates 20% of the world's oxygen. But now scientists understand that it also functions as the pumping heart of the Earth's hydrological system. Billions of Amazon trees pump water vapor into the sky, forming massive flying rivers with a daily flow greater than the Amazon River itself, which is the largest river in the world, spreading rain to the entire continent and the world beyond. NASA calls the Amazon rainforest the engine of the global weather system. Indigenous peoples of the Amazon have always called it the heart of the world. It is clearly a vital organ of the Earth's biosphere. Yet every minute, an area the size of seven football fields is being destroyed by industrial activities. This short-sighted destruction is threatening the life-sustaining systems of our planet, as well as releasing the forest's massive stockpile of carbon and greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. But there is hope. Where the Andes Mountains descend into the Amazon Basin, at the very headwaters of the Amazon River, we find one of the most critical opportunities for intervention. The indigenous peoples who live there consider the region sacred and for decades have diligently protected it from the constant threat of incursion by extractive industries. Now, a global alliance is forming to support their call for permanent protected status of this critical region. What happens to the headwaters affects the entire river basin. El bosque es sagrado para nosotros porque es allí donde nace el agua que recorre en las venas de la Amazonía. Teeming with life, these sacred headwaters are also treasured by biologists, for it is here that they have discovered the highest levels of biodiversity for plants, birds, mammals, and amphibians in all of the Amazon basin, and very likely in the entire world. For example, in one hectare of rainforest here, there are more tree species than in all of the US and Canada combined. Paleontologists have evidence that this area served as a refuge for plant and animal species during the mass extinction of the last ice age, a sort of Noah's Ark, and it is expected to be a similarly critical refuge in the face of global warming. The Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative supports indigenous peoples' continued stewardship of this ecologically, culturally, and spiritually significant region. It aims to establish a globally recognized and protected biocultural sanctuary for the future of all life. Proteger las cuencas sagradas es una gran esperanza para proteger la diversidad biológica y cultural de nuestro territorio, incluso para salvar la vida de la humanidad. The initiative will engage the governments and civil society of Ecuador and Peru, as well as the global community and negotiate solutions based on the twin goals of protecting living systems and advancing human well-being. La recientemente creada iniciativa de las cuencas sagradas del Napo y del Marañón pretenden constituirse en una región biocultural, un santuario de la biodiversidad, un lugar en donde los pueblos indígenas pueden ejercer sus procesos de autodeterminación y gobernar de una manera diferente sus territorios, 
un lugar en donde los indicadores del buen vivir pueden realmente dar paso a un nuevo momento de desarrollo en el lugar más biodiverso del planeta. We invite you to be a part of this exceptional opportunity to conserve biodiversity, respect indigenous people's rights, and protect the heart of our planet for present and future generations. Well, that's, uh, that's a beautiful beginning because it gives you the background of what we're going to talk about and against the background that Jim created. Um, I just want to re remind us that what you just saw, that the Amazon sacred headwaters region survived the Pleistocene era, the Ice Age, served as a kind of Noah's Ark for millions of species who survived the Ice Age and then repopulated life. And given the enormous uh, challenge we face now with the climate crisis, this region has always been important, but now we understand its importance way, way, way more than ever before. Given that it's the source of the entire Amazon system, which ultimately is the source, uh, one of the key sources of our climate system. So um, I thought we should start with your wonderful words, Atosa, about the Amazon itself and um, give us a little bit of an education about the whole Amazon and then the Amazon sacred headwaters and why it's so important. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so yeah, just starting stepping back, looking at planet Earth from space. What we notice is that the rainforest, the tropical rainforests, form a band that's 3000 miles wide around the equator. So the earth has this green belt around the equator that basically helps to regulate the climate, generate rain and create basically conditions for life. And of course that process evolved over millions and millions of years. The Amazon is the largest rainforest within that system, within the green belts of the equator. And globally, we've already lost half of the world's rainforests. So it's really um, critical to understand what's happening to the climate, what's happening to mass extinction crisis from a perspective of the earth as a living system with the rainforest as its vital organs. And you, know, you, could, you could not uh, survive a loss of a vital organ like a heart or lungs. Well, the rainforest is both the heart and the lungs of the biosphere. And so when you look at the Amazon basin, the largest rainforest on the planet, it is literally, uh, you know, nine countries, nine countries of the uh, region make up the Amazon. And what we have is we have this incredible system that NASA calls, like you saw in the video, the heart of the weather system of the planet. Uh, the, each tree, and I'll explain that a little bit of why we say not just, it's, it's the lungs, of course it's the lungs, everyone has called it the lungs of the earth in the way that the Amazon rainforest, the trees absorb CO2, they, they absorb CO2 and breathe out oxygen, kind of like our own lungs. So that it is true that it is the lungs of the planet. It's also the heart of the planet in the way that the trees help to also cycle moisture and rain and pump that across the planet. You saw in the NASA, um, you know, video clip of the video of how trees basically create low pressure system that pull in the moisture. And then uh, basically when it rains, the trees evapotranspire moisture and vapor back into the sky. So one mature tree in the Amazon has the ability to basically raise a thousand liters of water vapor a day into the sky. Now you have 400 billion trees in the Amazon. To all together, those trees generate basically a massive flying river, larger than the Amazon River itself, every day into the sky. And that is basically bringing moisture uh, across the South American continent into the Southern Cone, making the South American continent the greenest continent on earth. But it's also hitting the Andes and some of that moisture, some of those atmospheric rivers 
are heading north to Mexico, California, and across the planet. In particular, we know that moisture content in the Sierra Nevada is in part influenced by weather patterns in the Amazon. So this entire system, the Amazon as a heart of the, bi they call it the biotic pump. Biologists call it the biotic pump. The heart pump of rain and moisture across the planet. That is the system of the Amazon. Now that system is in basically free fall. We are at a tipping point of no return. Um, we, just last week, um, my colleagues from a coalition of groups called Protect 80% of the Amazon by 2025, a campaign that's led by indigenous peoples has uh, released a report that said 26% of the forests in the Amazon are either deforested or severely degraded to the point where that cycling of the tree, cycling a thousand liters of water per day, that system is starting to unravel. And it might take about 50 to 70 years for the Amazon to die back, but it's predicted it could die back a significant part of the Amazon. Something like 70% of the Amazon could become a savanna instead of a rainforest. And that could take 50 to 70 years, but the point at which we cross the threshold towards that shift is now, basically. But the report also said there's hope. If we act now, we can get to zero deforestation and launch massive reforestation efforts to restore the heart of the planet, to recognize that there is no life on planet Earth without the functioning of the Amazon rainforest system. It's the heart of the hydro, hydrological climatic system of the biosphere. I know that's a lot of big words, but what we need is we need basically the masses, um, populations everywhere to understand the living, vital living systems of the earth systems. And so there are scientific panels that are looking and tracking this and are saying, you know, in fact, climate change is not just a crisis of CO2 emissions, it's also a crisis of the hydrological system being out of balance. We experience climate change through droughts, which is a shortage of water, through floods, which is an excess of water, imbalance of water, hurricanes. Um, basically the way moisture behaves into the, in the atmosphere is a function of how the biosphere is able to regulate the hydrological system. So the climate crisis and the imbalance in the hydrological system are incredibly linked. And this link comes back to how we, how we address this imbalance is through protecting forests, wetlands, um, gardens, through basically bringing plants and life on earth in balance in, order, in, in watersheds. And so, so that's just in a sense, the ecological imperative of protecting the rainforest. The Amazon sacred headwaters is basically you could say it's the crucible of life. It's one of the most, it is actually been documented to have the highest biodiversity anywhere else in the Amazon basin, which makes it the most biodiverse place on earth. And here we have um, indigenous peoples, something like 30 indigenous nations who have lived in harmony with this forest, who've been its stewards. In fact, the majority of the well-preserved forests are in both national parks and indigenous territories. However, indigenous people's territories have even lower deforestation than parks. And all across the Amazon basin, we're seeing this pattern where indigenous peoples are doing an amazing job. They're actually effective at um, re and having lower deforestation rates than even places that are supposedly national parks or protected areas. And that's not just in the Amazon, it's around the world. Um, UN studies have shown that 80% of the world's biological diversity, so 80% of all life that exists still on this planet is on indigenous lands and lands that indigenous peoples are stewarding. 60% of the world's intact forests are on indigenous people's territories. Well, we can say that is in part because of indigenous people's worldview, you heard from, and you will hear from Domingo, that the earth is alive, that she is our mother, and that our responsibility is to be in service to future generations, to the seventh generation. And that, that view, that worldview, that paradigm helps indigenous peoples 
basically live in harmony and seek harmony constantly in, in service to life. And what we see in the sacred headwaters is this huge swath of roadless, pristine, uh, you know, biodiverse rainforest. But about 80% of this area is threatened with future development plans like oil drilling and mining and logging and roads and dams. And so basically the area is at crossroads. The next 10 to 30 years, when you do projections of the current plans on the books of the governments would bring deforestation, devastation, the, basically the fragmentation of this incredibly important uh, you know, the most important, the, actually the largest collection of plants and animals and cultures on planet Earth exist here. And it's basically where we need to figure out how to transition from a life-blind economy to a life-seeing, life-affirming economy. And so here the indigenous people said that, no, we cannot let this current trajectory, we have to take a different path, we have to shift we have to fo focus on permanent protection and not just of small areas where we've been fighting in this block and this oil block and this mining project, but work actually across the entire bioregion to create a, you know, what would be the largest indigenous uh, governed protected region that would be serving life, serving the ecological transition that we all need to, to go through across the planet, but here, in the most biodiverse uh, heart of the planet, we need to figure out how to move from this path we're on, which is destruction, mining, degradation, pollution, human rights violations, and the loss of species, countless species, um, from, a, from that path to a path that's about uh, a standing forest economy, an economy that sees life, that affirms life, that is about increasing conditions conducive to more life. That is the holistic vision of the sacred headwaters. So the indigenous peoples came together five and a half years ago and said, no, we can't let this future be the reality. We need to envision a different future. And through that process, they worked on for the last five years, a bioregional plan. This is a um, bioregional plan. I'll put the link, you can download it um, or you can go to sacredheadwaters.org. This plan spells out how we go from this death economy to a regenerative economy. It has agenda for land rights, for uh, reforestation, restoration, alternative livelihoods for better life conditions for the people who live in this forest. There's about 700,000 people who live in this rainforest in addition to another 2.3 million non-Indigenous. And so all of this territory needs to have a life-affirming economy. So we've helped map out the pathways, the solutions. Uh, a plan is from here to 2030. We're looking for investors and investments and know how to create this alternative economy. We're also supporting indigenous peoples in stopping the bad things, the oil and the mining and the destruction and through legal actions and protests and things that we've always done, uh, which is hold back of the avalanche of destructive projects. And in that way, we're strengthening both the, you know, the muscle that is stopping the bad buying time and the, the real work, which is about transformation and transition. And so I'll stop there and we can come back to discussing how and what and what are the elements, but I'd love for you all to hear from Domingo Peas, William Clare. He's uh, someone I've known for 20 years. I've worked with him since 1990. Sorry, since 2000. Since 2000, I've worked with Domingo Peas all over the Amazon. He's been an incredible leader to the Atuar Nation, but also to the indigenous peoples of Ecuador, to the indigenous peoples of the Bayou region of Peru, Ecuador, the Sacred Headwaters region, which is an area the size of the state of Oregon, just to give you a perspective of how big this area is. And he's been tireless. Uh, voice for unity, for courage, for action, and for being visionary, for taking bold stance right now in this moment for humanity. And um, so should we, can we bring Domingo Peas? Yes, Domingo. <clears throat> so 
Now, I think Rafaela hopefully is translating for him. Yeah, or you are. Uh, Domingo puede ab abrir su cámara. Quiero presentar Domingo Peas. Por favor. No sé, no sé, no puedo abrir mi cámara. Ah, el, el coordinador tiene que pedirte, darte permiso. Can the uh, host please give Domingo a prompt to turn on his camera? Sí, tiene permiso. Aquí estás. Bueno. <laughs> Gracias, gracias por ese permiso. Domingo, si gracias, puedes hablar, yo traduzco. Ya, yeah. gracias a Tosa, como siempre. Y gracias, Rafaelita, por su traducción igual, he revisado. Gracias, Lynn, por saludarte a los ya casi 15 días. Eh, thank, you. thank you, Lynn. Lynn gracias. Thank you, Tosa. Eh, primeramente agradecer a los que me escuchan, mujeres, hombres, siempre de corazón, siempre de buena voluntad, de buena fe, quienes me van a escuchar este momento, estoy muy agradecido. So first I want to thank you, Lynn, and the organizers of this event, for, and Rafael Anatosa for helping me with translation. I want to say I want to say greetings to the and thank you to the men and women of good hearts and good faith and all of you who have shown up here with open hearts to listen to my message. Um, todos los humanos somos buenos cuando conviene y también somos malos. He sido uno de los achuar de la selva, nacido en la selva, que también pensaba ser empresario muy, muy, muy ambicioso. Pero gracias a la educación de la vida, ahora estoy trabajando para bien común, para la conservación de la Amazonía. Con esta iniciativa, Cuencas Sagradas, Territorios de Vida, que Matosa ya mencionó. So, um, human beings can, you know, can be a force for good, but they can also be a force for bad. I, I myself was born in the forest, and before I received my full formation and education, I too wanted to be a, you know, ambitious businessman who was out to, for the forest, to, to, out, to, out to get the forest, uh, exploit the forest. But through education, I, I changed. I became conscious and I began to become a leader and work for the benefit of the forest. And that's why I'm one of the people who's helping lead the Sacred Headwaters Initiative that Atosa mentioned to you. Eh, es muy importante esto que aprendemos cada, cada uno, aprendemos cada día. Uno de lo que yo aprendí es eh, no trabajar Looks like we no solo lost. para mí, sino para todos. O sea, quería ser empresario del bien común. En esto, al respeto a la naturaleza, al respeto a este ecosistema. Para nosotros, el, el cada sueño, nuestro plan de trabajo ha sido cada sueño. Y gracias a esta conexión espiritual que tenemos, real y mundo humano. Y eso nos ha permitido cuidar la selva con todo su ecosistema y esto queremos ahora dar servicio a la humanidad, compartir con la humanidad ¿verdad? para que esta Amazonía existente de, de todo continente sirva a la humanidad. Pero ahí esta Amazonía tiene gran amenaza por sistema actual, eh, grandes amenazas tanto de afuera como de uh, Domingo, voy a, voy a intentar traducir lo que ha dicho mientras que su conexión está cortando. I'm just going to translate what he said so, while we wait for his connection to return. Um, he said, you know, that indigenous peoples are working 
you know, I, what I learned every day, we educate ourselves. And what I learned working with my people is to work for the well-being, for the common good, to respect nature, to respect ecosystems, to respect the rights of nature, because to have, a, you know, basically a, a, res- a reverence for the sacred. For us, um, every one of our plans comes from our dreams. We are uh, people of the dreams. Our work plans, our our uh, our actions come from this spiritual understanding of our connection with the forest, with the sacred, with the ecosystem. That we are caretakers. Our understanding that we are caretakers, and we're not just caretaking for ourselves, but we're take care caring for this forest for all of humanity. And then not just for the forest where we're in now, but for all of the Amazon, we need to care for the entire Amazon basin. And, uh, and this is for all of humanity to, that this, to recognize that also we have great threats facing the forest. We have threats from within the forest and we have threats that are external. They're coming from the outside. Okay, hasta que... Hay amenazas de adentro y de afuera. Sí, entonces para esto hemos... Sí. Domingo, a lo mejor si apagas tu cámara, se... es la conexión está mejor. Es una alianza primero entre indígenas. ¿Aló? Sí, Corto. una... Disculpa, disculpa. Si tú uh, apagas tu cámara, a lo mejor la conexión está mejor. Ok. Gracias, muchas gracias. Ok, el domingo sigues. Gracias. Una gran alianza entre indígenas, indígenas de Perú, indígenas de Ecuador. Uno, primer momento importante para cuidar... Segundo es buscar alianza afuera. Esta alianza ha sido equipo de trabajo que me decía Atosa, buscar personajes importantes que otras personas para postular este programa para el resto de la sociedad. El tres, ahora estamos trabajando para hacer influencia al mundo entero, a los gobiernos del turno, a los empresarios, a los científicos, a las mujeres, a la juventud, para que este programa se ha hecho con la participación íntegra de todo ser humano. Sin mirar los colores, no importa de, de, de qué lugar. Entonces, esto ha sido un cambio de pensar con ciencia en la humanidad. Eh, y este trabajo es duro, pero no es difícil, no es imposible. Es trabajo muy duro, pero estamos avanzando poco a poco y ahorita... Eh, eh, es tan claro que solamente unidos entre indígenas, no indígenas, entre gobiernos del turno, vamos a frenar este gran problema de cambio climático. Gracias, Domingo. Hasta ahí. Yeah. So we have been working in this, first of all, the sacred headwaters began with being an alliance, an alliance among indigenous peoples, the indigenous peoples of Ecuador and also the indigenous peoples of Northern Peru, 30 indigenous nations. This, that was our first goal is to unite ourselves and that continues to continue to be united. Second is the work to create alliances, external alliances, to look for people, people of conscience, people who care, people who are, um, people and organizations that want to be part of our programs for real change, for real transformation, both in our region and uh, for the third thing, which is the third thing, which is influencing influencing the world, influencing what's happening around the world, uh, to recruit and unite scientists, governments, women, youth, especially government, uh, wisdom keepers, elders, all of us, uh, business people, investors we all need to come together we need it's very hard work this is very difficult work but we need to unite for future of humanity little by little we're making some big difference uh, but the really key is unity because it, unless the governments 
the people, the companies, the business sector, the indigenous people, unless we unite and work together. And that's the only way we're gonna address the crisis of climate that we face today. Sí, es Domingo. Ya, yeah. una de las cosas importantes eh, de frenar la gran amenaza de afuera y adentro toca crear emprendimientos, toca crear programas. Eh, todos, ahora el ser humano está enfocado al desarrollo, está enfocado a educación, está enfocado al desarrollo económico, por eso hay esta amenaza, por lo que toca crear programas en los territorios, fondos grandes, fondos de restauración, fondos de reforestación, re, fondos de limpieza de aguas contaminadas, ríos tratados, hay que hacer ríos tratados de las grandes ciudades. Toca ya frenar el sistema de energía, no solamente depender de combustible. Entonces, esto es esfuerzo que tenemos que hacer todos los sectores sociales, los inversiones ya no deben invertir para extraer más petróleo, más minería, sino los grandes que tienen posibilidad deben invertir para la restauración, para la bioeconomía, para la reforestación e incluso para los bioemprendimientos de los, en los territorios para que los amazónicos indígenas sigan cuidando, protegiendo con amor, con corazón y que tengan vida digna, el buen vivir. Eso, eso sería mi, mi llamado. Gracias, Domingo. Déjame hasta allá. So, as I said, it's important to know that there's threats from within and from uh, outside and from inside. And so there's so much focusing on economic development. Everything's about economic development. And so in order to address what's happening in the region, we have to create programs for alternative economies. We have to look for all sectors to come together to have programs that bring, bring uh, alternatives to the territories, uh, such as restoration, ecosystem restoration, reforestation, the cleaning up of waste streams from sewage and from, from uh, basically large cities, waste streams from large cities that dump into the headwaters, into the river systems. We have to change the energy system. We can't just continue to build, um, build energy systems that are based on fossil fuels. We have to look for clean energy. We have to involve social movements and social sectors, but also investors. If investors can basically see that they have to take their money out of petroleum, take their investments out of sectors that are destructive and instead invest in restoration, in bioeconomies, in basically, uh, yeah, basically the economies that serve life. That's what we have to do. And that the indigenous people recognize that indigenous people are in the forest. They're caring for the forest, but they need alternative economies for their own well-being so that they are continuing to be able to protect the forest with all their heart and with their with love with with their heart and with their with their daily existence and their traditions hasta allá domingo sigue so atosa maybe um, uh, oh, invitar round and then we'll we'll go on to uh, you and me okay go ahead domingo puedes seguir como su última intervención después vamos a tener conversación Última intervención. Agradecer a todos esos de buen corazón que siguen aportando para esta conservación de nuestra madre tierra, madre naturaleza. Eh, y... No estoy escuchando. Mujeres de buen corazón, que eduquemos, eduquemos a las empresas, a los empresarios, a los profesores. ¿Me escucha? ¿Aló? Sí, sí, ahora sí. Hola, hola, hola. Ya, sí, internet está mal. Nos decía que 
agradecer una vez más a esas mujeres y hombres de buen corazón que siguen aportando para el cuidado de nuestra madre tierra, madre naturaleza. Cuenca Sagrada ha tenido apoyo uh, puntual bueno eh, de estos solidarios, solidarias. E invito que hagamos la conciencia. Es difícil este trabajo. El sistema está súper, súper consumidor, pero tenemos que aunar esfuerzo entre todos, hombres, mujeres, sabios y sabias, indígenas, no indígenas. Tenemos que trabajar juntos. No es... Es difícil, pero no es imposible. Mientras vivimos, tenemos que trabajar para nueva generación. ¿Cómo hacerlo eso? Es haciendo educación, creando conciencia a todos los sectores sociales. No mirar de dónde somos, de qué color somos. Somos humanos que realmente necesitamos vida digna. Hasta ahí mi llamado y gracias por escucharme. Uh, Atosa, Atosa, you're, you're on muted. mute. You're muted, Atosa. We sorry, didn't hear sorry, that. sorry. Again. So in his uh, final intervention, uh, Domingo says, I just want to thank again the women and men of good hearts, the good hearted people who have been caring for the sacred headwaters, caring for the Amazon, caring for Mother Earth, uh, that we have been at the sacred headwaters benefited from people like yourselves through their support, through their solidarity and support that we are working, this work that we need to do together with all of you is to create change in consciousness. It's difficult, this work is difficult because we are facing a very highly super cons consumer oriented uh, society, but we really need to unite. We need to bring together elders, women, men, uh, young people, uh, business people. We need basically every walk of life to come together to serve, to recognize that their purpose should be to serve future generations and work for the future. We need to educate ourselves. We need to recognize that color does not matter. Race does not matter. That really we all deserve a dignified life and we need to serve the future of uh, humanity. So I thank you all for listening and uh, thanks for the organizers as well. Thank you, Atosa, and thank you, Domingo. Um, I really appreciate everybody who's listening. Uh, I want you to appreciate the intensity of the work that the indigenous people themselves are doing in the face of the mammoth, vast, almost overwhelming economic system that we all are in. We're all facing that too, but their uh, courage and Domingo's courage He's been in China, he's been in Norway, he's been in London, he's been in Paris, he's been in the United Nations, he's been all over the world. And he comes from a, a, a small community in the Amazon uh, where he and his uh, traditions are about hunting and fishing and shamanism and ayahuasca and you know making fishnets. And he is a, a ambassador from that place of the, beauty of that kind of life all over the world facing the magnitude of the economic system uh, in which we're all kind of trapped. So I want to say a couple things about the uh, Amazon Sacred Headwaters itself. And, um, and, and because of, um, you know, everybody on this call not speaking Spanish, otherwise we would let Domingo go, 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 go for it because it is led by them, not by people like us. We're very useful. Uh, Atosa is incredibly brilliant. So, but the the indigenous people are the leaders of this, and that's an important point to make. And they need to stay at the center of it because their cosmovision, their way of seeing the world, their understanding of the deep and profound spiritual nature of life itself, is where the whole world is needing to go in order to resolve the big challenges we face. And yet, without their allies, like Atosa, like myself, like all of you, um, they, they can't be heard. Uh, there's no space for them. There's no room for them. There's no platform. So um, I invite all of us to make a platform, not only for indigenous people, but to make a platform in your heart for the Amazon Sacred Headwaters 
initiative, which is now called the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Alliance. Because uh, some people would say this is the middle of nowhere, uh, because when you fly there, you see vast, 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 vast forests and no roads, no roads, no oil, no logging. Most of this, much of it, not all, but much of it is absolutely pristine. It is roadless. It is magnificent. It is the uh, expression of life itself. Um, and the indigenous people, even though oil company after mining company after oil company have, uh, have bought huge chunks of it from the Ecuadorian and Peruvian governments, the indigenous people have been so fierce, so strong, and so spiritually powerful that they haven't let any of these companies uh, in many cases, not everywhere, but in many of these cases, in at all. Even though big companies with millions of employees and billions of dollars have paid money to get in there and extract things, the indigenous people um, have said, no, uh, you're not coming in here. No roads. We won't even allow them. Um, and there's parts that have been exploited, but I'm just wanting to say what, if you can imagine Wherever you live, if you live in Seattle or if you live in Paris or if you live in, in you know, in, in Italy or in, in Japan, um, if you can imagine huge forces coming in to take over your yard, your house, your parks, your, um, your schools uh, with their machines to extract something under the earth that you didn't even know is there. Uh, and you say no, and they say too bad, we're doing it anyway. Um, that That's kind of the, if you can imagine that, and they've said no and kept them out. So they're so strong and there's a spiritual depth to these people and they work totally communally. So just uh, imagine the way we individuate, we individuate where the individual's wishes can be at the expense of the community. We, we advance almost at the expense of each other because of our competitive kind of system that we're in. They advance in community with each other, in collaboration. That's how they do everything. The good of the community is the highest good. And then within that, people in, individuate. We individuate first. And then if the good of the community isn't part of the, our, our benefit, then that's too bad. So I'll just say there's so much to learn from indigenous people. They're not perfect. Uh, they're, there's a, they have the challenges we have. Um, at the same time, um, together, we can make a miracle. We can make a miracle. The Sacred Headwaters is the most biodiverse place on earth. To put it in, um, in some sort of status where it's permanently protected, which doesn't exist yet on earth, there is no such thing as permanent protection on earth yet or permanent protected status, if there's such a word as that. But there wasn't rights of nature either, which was yesterday's conversation. Nature never had rights until now. So the impossible, as Domingo said <clears throat> so beautifully, uh, is possible. Uh, the insurmountable is in fact surmountable. <clears throat> and I wanna just give even though the problems are immense, I want to say there's a lot of hope with this project, this initiative, this alliance, because it's 30 indigenous, indigenous nations, nations, three zero, 30 nations, and then two sovereign countries, Peru and Ecuador, working together and, you know, challenging, yes, difficult, yes, some disagreements in there, yes, but basically, fundamentally, an alignment, can this be the place? most biodiverse place on earth. Can this be the location that that actually is the place where the, the transformation, the shift begins from what John Perkins, one of our founders of Pachamama Line says, a primarily a death economy, economy that extracts and takes and overconsumes and accumulates to a life economy. Um, can this be the place where Ecuador and Peru forego what's been massive profits for them, oil and mining, gold, uh, uh, metals, uh, forego that, uh, which they are starting to really see they must and move into a standing forest economy or an economy, a life economy, using new economic mechanisms, using new 
financial lenses because we're all kind of caught in the financial systems that will be about <clears throat> preservation and empowering indigenous people who are the natural custodians of these forests rather than than constantly fighting the the massive massive hunger or like almost uh, consumptive monster that wants to take these forests and turn them into commodities. So um, uh, I, I just want to add my own passion and my gratitude for Domingo and all the all the indigenous people we work with who are so um, you know amazing. They the, where they come from, who they are, and the depth with which they love this forest and the fierceness with which they defend it is a uh, extraordinary experience to to engage with and i invite you all to engage with the amazon sacred headwaters initiative and to feel that energy but also the spiritual power of this place um when you go there and we invite people to go with pachamama lines we take journeys there very very powerful journeys um when you go there if you have that great opportunity and privilege to go, you will feel your deep and profound relatedness with every living thing. You will feel the trees are beings. Uh, you will feel the, the, the leaves, the plants, the insects, the snakes, the, the, the creatures are uh, kin to the indigenous people. And they don't live in the forest. They, the indigenous people, are of the forest. And it's had me see that, um, and they're also dream cultures, so their dreams guide them. And they've had me see, and I'll say probably also for Tosa, I'm sure, and many of us, Bill Twist, and all of us who work together, that we're being called by the future to do this work. It's not like, oh, what should we work on the rest of our lives? Let's pick that. Oh, that looks fun. Oh, I like those people. Yes, yeah, some of those things come into play, but really, what's calling what's coming through us we are instruments of something we are part of the natural world we're not living in the natural world or fighting fighting for the natural world we are the natural world expressing itself you and i and if you can feel that if you can feel that calling um uh we are of the natural world defending who we are as a living system um and we're not uh, fighting against, we're fighting for. There's a lot of things to fight against and I respect that. But the power of the indigenous people is uh, fighting for or living for. And so um, I wanna give Atosa uh, uh, some last words too because the Amazon Sacred Headwaters initiative, which is now called the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Alliance, just in the last few days, because there was a planning meeting in Lima, and, the, and the, they decided to change that name from initiative, because it's been initiated. It's initiated. It's underway. There's a bioregional plan that says exactly what to do to transform Ecuador and Peru into uh, life honoring economies. There is a bioregional plan that says exactly what to do to have indigenous people have living livelihoods, transportation, education, and stay as the defenders of the forest. There is a bioregional plan that, that says exactly what to do to keep out roads and mining and oil. So there's not only hope, there's a plan and it's initiated, it is underway. And there's new financial net mechanisms being born in the vast financial economic system that could, and I say will, be the financial mechanisms or new ways of seeing finance that can finance this kind of massive, massive undertaking to preserve nearly a, a 100 million acres of pristine tropical rainforest and show the world that it can be done, that it is happening, rather than um, ecocide, which is uh, the name of an organization we also respect that's trying to um, make it criminal to destroy an ecosystem on which life depends. So um, <clears throat> Atosa, would you just uh, give some last words and then we'll get into a discussion with Jim and, and anyone on the chat. <clears throat> Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'll just add that, yeah, beautifully put, Lynn, and I, everything you say is just coming from your heart and coming from like I say, the heart of the earth itself, herself. 
I think that the important thing to say right now is that the indigenous peoples have created an unprecedented alliance. They've recruited some of their long trusting allies. Uh, we've together built this beautiful vision for the last three to four years. We've been working on this bi-regional plan. And now we're moving from dreaming the dream to action. And the actions that we've envisioned are so massive and so uh, basically ambitious and so exciting and very holistic. Indigenous peoples think in terms of life plans. They think about uh, you know everything from the well-being of all life uh, internally within the territories and then radiating out. Uh, I know someone, uh, Domingo mentioned Buen Vivir. I don't think I did enough of a job to translate that. Buen Vivir, the concept of Buen Vivir, the living in harmony, it's the collective well-being or living well, is a concept that comes from indigenous cosmology. It's this idea of collective harmony from all the way from within the village, among the people who live in the village, then the village and the forest and the forest and the bioregion and the bioregion, the watershed to the bioregion, to the nation, to the world. This concept of fractal, fractal concept of collective harmony is a mantra, is a part of the DNA of indigenous peoples cosmology. That first of all, the forest is alive and that we are the forest. We are part of the forest. We are the forest. And that ultimately harmony is con forest is constantly seeking, life is constantly seeking to be in harmony. And that the collective harmony, which is the well-being of everyone matters and life, the well-being of all life, not just human life matters. That mantra, that that sort of driving prime directive is the indigenous cosmology that's guiding the Sacred Headwaters Initiative and the bioregional plan. So we've we've put a lot of effort, and actually by, uh, the concept of uh, Buen Vivir is in the Ecuadorian constitution, as is the rights of nature. So it's something that is being basically embraced by the whole of the society here. How to implement it, as Domingo said, it's really, really difficult, but it's not impossible if we work together. And so we're going from planning, we now moving to action, and the actions require investments in the tons of in the in the eighteen billion dollar range over the next ten years. Eighteen billion dollars over the next ten years to take an area the size of the state of Oregon, that's the most biodiverse rainforest on earth, and convert the economy to protect the territories to restore twenty million acres of rainforest would need to be restored to ensure connectivity between the highlands and the lowlands uh, and to address things like cattle ranching and mining. We would need to do massive cleanup of contaminated areas that have been destroyed by oil companies. We need to do uh, food sovereignty, food security, um, bring in solar canoes, bring in uh, alternative energy to communities who are right now dependent also on, uh, on diesel fuel for their boat engines and gasoline for their boat engines and to really push the education and healthcare system to be uh, you know, more culturally appropriate because right now indigenous peoples have uh, access to education that actually pushes them to stop being indigenous. And so changing the education system to be ecological education and culturally appropriate. Um, Domingo, I would love for him to say a few words um, about the Living Amazon School which is the one of the first initiatives we're working on to support bringing together elders and youth uh, to become the cadre, the core. The same uh, Atosa, the core. Atosa, we, we, we want to make sure we have room for dialogue. And so we're getting sure. close to the end. So it can't be very long. OK. OK. So um, yeah, so that is we uh, do dialogue here. Um, so maybe we'll just take wait your for time. Video. Take your time. This is important. <laughs> Uh, Domingo, no sé si quieres mencionar la Escuela Eva un poco de este tema para una de las iniciativas. Uh, so, yeah, Sacred Headwaters is really uh, got some immediate initiatives, and one of them is the school that Domingo is helping lead, the creation of a new school. Domingo. Bueno, es? este, um, sí, uno de los programas en, en este plan bioregional a más de lo que es la conservación 
el mundo necesita educarse y se crea una escuela, escuela de liderazgo para indígenas y para la humanidad. Vamos a comenzar como indígenas, preparando porque también estamos contaminándonos eh, en todo sentido. Entonces, eh, y también estamos dejando la sabiduría propia. Entonces se ha visto necesario crear esta escuela, Escuela Viva de la Amazonía, EVA, donde se va a formar 46 estudiantes, dos por organizaciones en Ecuador, como son 23, son 46 estudiantes que vamos a arrancar. Eh, esto posiblemente después de, de, en el proceso queremos que esta escuela sea para todos para que indígenas, no indígenas, podamos aprender juntos, juntos, y la juventud ya no tenga esa resistencia que existe ahora, el mundo de afuera, el mundo de la selva, o mundo indígena, mundo empresarial, no. Tenemos que crear esta escuela para que la próxima generación sean autoridades limpios, conscientes, sanos, ¿ya? Sean políticos de corazón, solidarios, sean de respeto, honrados, honestos, porque ahora está llenando ese vacío de corrupción. Entonces, esta escuela queremos comenzar próximo año. Esta escuela va a enmarcar en rescate de cultura, sabiduría propia, pero también se va a aprender del mundo científico de afuera. Así es que también invitamos que, que los hijos estudien esta escuela, porque eh, hemos visto que un vacío espiritual del mundo moderno. ¿Sí? Hasta ahí, no sé si habrá pregunta. Gracias, Domingo. So um, one of the initiatives of the Sacred Headwaters, as Latoso mentioned, is the Living Amazon School. Uh, because why? Because what we realize is indigenous peoples, we're starting to lose our in traditional knowledge, uh, our own form of understanding the world, our own form of, uh, you know, wisdom is being lost. And to res rescue that, We are st we're starting with small, we're starting with 46 students, initially just internally, working within the indigenous federations uh, in Ecuador, uh, two for each of the indigenous, 23 indigenous um, federations. And then eventually the school will expand to include non-indigenous um, because we want everyone to have access to understanding, to learning from indigenous peoples, to learn together actually, um, because also, The young people in our culture have uh, also been leaving behind their own traditional knowledge and resisting their own traditional knowledge. There's this clash between the modern world and the forest world, the indigenous world and the non-indigenous world. We want to basically train the next generation to become conscious, to become good leaders, to become good stewards of our territories, uh, to be political leaders who are of the heart because right now what we have is a lot of political leaders who are corrupt. We have a major gap, corruption, proliferation of corruption. The next uh, effort will be to bring cultural rescue together uh, and cultural rescue and cultural knowledge, uh, worldviews of indigenous peoples together with the latest technology in modern science and how we protect forests. And we want that, uh, you know, even your kids to have the opportunity to learn from the indigenous people. Eventually the school will be for both, will include uh, non-indigenous because we want to share this wisdom with all. We'll stop there. Um, well, I, I just moved my next thing. So I was, I was going to be um, running out of time here. Um, so thank you so much for adding the living school because that's a really important part of what, what all this is. Um, and we just, um, We have so much we could say. Uh, I also would love for you to play uh, uh, Tosa the one minute version of 2041, if you can. Do you have screen sharing power? I, uh, um, 
we have this yeah. one minute. It's a teaser for another film, and I, it's, I think it's a good way to uh, to end not end this discussion, but launch the next phase of it. So let's see if you can do that. And on the bottom of the screen, when you share screen, it says optimize sound and optimize visual. So see if you can do that, Atosa. Can you? I'm not sure. It's not. Uh, it's not letting me. Um, oh, it's not letting you. Okay, never mind. Never mind. We won't do that. But I want to say. I just want to say we made a beautiful nine-minute film. I put the link in the chat. Uh, it's called Amazonia 2041: A Vision from the Future. It's both in English and Spanish, and you can please watch it and share it. It's basically illustrated by uh, Ecuadorian artists. And it tells the story of how we, it's, it takes place in the future looking back at how we save the sacred headwaters and the Amazon and the world. And it looks at basically the imaginary timeline of things that are in the bioregional plan as if they actually happened. And so it's basically painting a future that we all want. Please share it. It's nine minutes. It's longer than usual, but it's really goes by really fast and it's very inspiring. So I hope everyone watches that. And also we have, a declaration for the permanent protection of the sacred headwaters. Invite everyone to go to sacredheadwaters.org and sign the declaration. Show your support for this effort. If your organizations and networks want to be a part of it as well, part of the alliance, please sign as an organization. Great. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Atosa. And um, I'll turn it back over to Jim for our conversation and I just want to say I know you typically end on the half hour but I can stay a little bit longer now I just changed my next thing and I don't know if Atosa and Domingo can but I can so cool well thank you Atosa thank you Domingo what a inspiring uh bright light that you are all three of you actually uh, and I was uh, just thinking uh, Domingo as you were speaking so passionately about the Amazon of all the activists around the world, journalists around the world uh, that are under severe duress and even being imprisoned and even uh, killed. And so I just wanted to just uh, ask the question, you know, uh, as you do your work there, are you able to do it in a safe environment or are you like so many of the great indigenous leaders, you know, under uh, persecution and threat? Domingo, Jim está preguntando si cómo es la situación de derechos humanos, las amenazas contra líderes, si tú personalmente has sido amenazado o si hay, cuál es la situación actual de derechos humanos en la región. Bueno, eh, gracias la pregunta. Este por ser defensores, menos yo, yo creo que como soy neutral no me molestan mucho, trabajo para la humanidad y claro, también soy parte indígena, respeto mucho la decisión de las organizaciones, pero también eh, trato de tranquilizar para que fluya problema. Entonces, pero mis hermanos indígenas, todos los defensores de todos los países amazónicos, si sí son criminalizados, no hay derecho humano. Eh, hay leyes para defensa de derecho, pero incluso en Brasil, en, en Perú, eh, es el peor caso por ser defensor de la Amazonía. Son perseguidos legalmente, son criminalizados, incluso son asesinados. Eso es el, el gran problema que tenemos en todos los países de la Amazonía. En Ecuador hemos frenado. Eh, en Ecuador eh, al menos estamos defendiéndonos y hay como que las autoridades sí están tomando en cuenta eh, respecto a la, al derecho humano. Hay leyes especiales, eh, derecho de la naturaleza, pero en la práctica falla. Eso estamos tratando como cuencas sagradas, como incidir en la política estatal nacional para que ya no haya más seguimiento de este crimen. 
Eh, entonces, en Ecuador, yo diría, está bajando, eh, pero toca trabajar más, toca trabajar más porque todos los que estamos rechazando eh, protesta en, por la extracción, por la minería, por las talas, eh, sí, siempre son eh, enjuiciados, demandados por el Estado. Eso en resumen, ¿no? Gracias. Thank you so much for the question. So for, yes, as you, you can imagine, being a defender of the forest has its risks. Uh, I have managed to stay neutral and work on uh, basically being, um, working for humanity and with a lot of respect, trying to calm things down when there's tensions. Uh, so I haven't been personally affected as much, but my brothers and sisters in the indigenous movements Yes, they've been very much affected. There's not in, there's no human rights happening right now. There uh, are many indigenous leaders who are criminalized for their protests. Mm -hmm. and, in, and worse yet, in countries like Peru, Brazil, and Colombia, they're persecuted, they're uh, criminalized, persecuted, and even assassinated. Uh, in Ecuador, things are a little bit not as bad, but uh, we are defending. We are defending our rights. We are. We have power. We are being taken seriously by authorities. We are in dialogue with authorities. But we also have had uh, special laws like the rights of nature, uh, law, laws that are not uh, laws that guarantee human rights and indigenous peoples' rights that are not followed. And so that's why the Sacred Headwaters Initiative does have a branch of our work, which is about. Uh, advocacy to influence public policy, to influence state actions. Um, we really are seeing a reduction in the, you know, a rise in power of indigenous people and a reduction in, in, in cases in Ecuador. But yes, many of my colleagues for their role in protest in resisting mining in resisting oil drilling and resisting the extractive industries are facing criminal charges. And so um, right now there are many leaders in Ecuador for their recent protests that are, that are facing legal, legal charges. So thank you for the question. Mm. And he well, said, he to said that we all have to work for justice. We have to come together in solidarity and work for justice. Mm -hmm. Lynn, did you have any comment? Yeah, I think we're very fortunate, we being Latosa and I and, and Domingo, to be working in Ecuador, uh, uh, centrally located in Ecuador rather than the other countries where there's a lot more violence. Um, Ecuador is, you know, it's it's a, there's a gentleness in the culture there and not so, such heavy drug trafficking, for example, and weaponizing in Ecuador as there are in other countries. However, it does happen, it is dangerous. And Domingo's, I think because of the way Domingo is, the, the generosity of heart and his warmth keeps him safe. It's funny, uh, not funny, it's interesting how that kind of an integrity sometimes actually is the best defense against uh, the kind of violent dangers that many indigenous people face. Mm, thank you. And I just would add, uh, Jim, that based, it's amazing what's happening right now in Ecuador. There was a 17-day uprising where indigenous people shut down the country in June. And yeah, um, I read about it. Yeah. It was historic. Uh, they showed political power. They nearly impeached, got the president impeached by the, the assembly because he wasn't willing to negotiate with indigenous leaders. The Congress, the, the Ecuadorian assembly, which is their Congress, said you have to and meet with the indigenous leadership and address their demands, or there'll be a vote of no confidence of the president. It was like that important. Uh, and there was, there was a dialogue table, which is not quite leading as far, not going as far as indigenous people want. They're in dialogue now with all the ministers, the minister of environment, the minister of hydrocarbons, the minister of education, healthcare. They're not really getting results that they want, but they are at the table. But one result that happened a few days ago was an agreement by the government to have a moratorium on all new oil drilling and new oil concessions, which is a major yeah. demand of indigenous people, and to rescind a decree that said the president had issued earlier in the year that said oil production would double in the Amazon. This is huge. It's buying us time to march in with the bioregional plan and say there is an alternative. But in other countries, I work a lot in Brazil and Colombia and other countries as well. And 
the murders and the assassinations and Peru recently the rise in drug trafficking has been horrible. So yeah. Well, let me just turn to one final question because I think it's it's sort of the other side of what I just asked. And that is that, you know, as we um, think about what's necessary, on the one hand, you know, we've got to get the, in that case, the Peruvian and the Ecuadorian governments to be working in a cooperative way. And it looks like there's been some progress under duress in Ecuador. Um, but as you think about the bioregional plan that needs now to gain an ascendancy and be actively promoted, what are the priorities uh, that, that you see that need to be implemented in order to make this a reality? Because what we need, as you both know, is some kind of meaningful breakthrough is sort of anywhere in the world so that, as Rupert Sheldrake says, the morphogenic field is set because a breakthrough anywhere makes it easier for people everywhere to replicate the same thing. So it's important that we concentrate our energy, it would seem to me, on the uh, Sacred Headwaters uh, Alliance to make sure that they succeed. So what, what would you say to the global community? We you know, we broadcast in over 130 countries. What would you say to the global community as to what the priorities are and how uh, we can help? I'll answer and then maybe uh, Domingo or Lynn want to add. I would say what is happening now, which is dialogue at the highest level of government between indigenous peoples and the uh, Ecuadorian government, that needs global support. We need to basically pay attention and encourage the government to really be in good faith negotiating policies that leave old economy behind. In fact, we can show that the new economy based on standing forest is a win-win for everyone. It's a win for the forest, it's a win for the government, it's a win for indigenous peoples. Um, the global financial community needs to come forth with massive debt relief, massive debt forgiveness mm -hmm. for biodiverse countries in the South including Brazil, including Ecuador, including Peru. These countries are mortgaging the Amazon to pay just the interest on their external debt, which oftentimes their external debt is bigger than their GDP. And so, you know, we need basically a re-architecture of the financial system to release countries from their debt burdens, to help them finance their government activities through other means. And also we need voluntary and other financial uh, incentives for protecting forests. We need to support people who live in the forest in living well so that their education and healthcare needs are met, their livelihood needs are met so that they are resistant to external uh, pressures of illegal logging, illegal mining, all of those things. So I would say internally, we need to support livelihoods. Externally, we need to remove these external uh, drivers of, of mortgaging the Amazon. There's many more things. The bioregional plan actually has a set of priorities. And immediately we're looking to raise money to implement in livelihood initiatives in the forests and also beef up indigenous people's uh, efforts for land rights, getting not only the title to their land, but also the right to decide whether a mine or a road goes forward or not. So legal rights, legal titles, and livelihood initiatives, and then this financial, international financial incentives. Beautiful. I'd love to do a, a program on humanity rising just on the issue of debt, because I think you're right. If, if the government governments are forced to leverage the Amazon to pay the interest, <laughs> not the principal, just the interest. You, it's like chattel slavery. They, they're, they're. It's not like they're bad people, but they're being given no other choice uh, by the uh, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, you know, and various multilateral institutions. And I think that's that's something could, that we could very usefully explore uh, on humanity rising, uh, because I think it's a it's a it's a it's a powerful global issue that people need to be educated about. So thank you for that, Lynn. Any uh, thing that you would say? Uh, well, 
definitely you're right. We need a breakthrough. <laughs> and I think this is the place where it can happen. As many enormous challenges as there are, it's different than Brazil where the challenges are even 10,000 times greater. Um, there is a There are people inside the Ecuadorian government that Atosa could even name that are very friendly to this new way forward. The same thing in the Peruvian government. Not everybody, but enough that there's a uh, there's a, a kernel. You know, I, I think about in my lifetime when the Berlin Wall fell down, uh, when apartheid ended. There was, you know, all this work. It looks like nothing is breaking through, nothing is breaking through, and then suddenly there's a breakthrough. And you don't know why that particular moment was chosen when Perestroika and Glasnost and you know all that you and I've seen, Jim, with President Gorbachev. You don't know why it's that moment, but everything that led up to it, it's like a, there's a tipping point that comes and we're in a tipping point at the Amazon now. So where is the tipping point going to take place on earth? And I think it's here and even in this place in the Amazon. And I think it's gonna have to do with massive financial resources being completely redirected. I think that's it. What you're talking about, it might be debt. It might be, you know, I've been talking to the, uh, you know, the powers that be at some of the biggest companies in the world, uh, one that carries the name of the Amazon even, uh, what's their responsibility uh, for driving, uh, you know, given that governments are paralyzed uh, and, and not effective, they have to get reelected. So they're paralyzed by that crazy system, uh, which makes yeah. them behave inconsistent with what they're committed to. Uh, who has the wherewithal, the money, the flexibility to really make stuff happen are the big giant financial resources that are sending money in the wrong direction, sending it in the right direction. So I think it's there. And that's what I work on. I love working on that. So who knows, but um, we need a breakthrough. We're going to have a breakthrough. And I say, this is the place and this is the time and this is the moment. Well, that is a powerful uh, point with which to end our program, uh, everyone. Uh, Tosa, Lynn, Domingo, thank you so much. Uh, you are uh, heroes uh, of the hour. And uh, I'd like to close, if I may, with uh, something from, uh, hello, Domingo. <laughs> uh, uh, something from Rilke. You made a comment uh, earlier, Lynn, about as you're getting more and more deeply involved in this, you're realizing that it's actually the future that's uh, working through us. And it called to mind a poem that I'm sure you know from Rainer Maria Rilke uh, that I wanna dedicate uh, to you, Domingo, uh, to you, Atosa, and to you, Lynn and Bill and the Pachamama Alliance. It's a very short poem and it goes like this. Time and again in history, some special people wake up. They have no ground in the crowd. They move to broader laws. They carry strange customs with them and demand room for bold and audacious action. The future speaks ruthlessly through them. They change the world. And that, my friends, is what is going to happen in the Amazonian headwaters because of Domingo and Atosa and Lynn and thousands of others that are supporting this effort. So in the spirit of the future speaking ruthlessly through us, uh, let us uh, say goodbye. And uh, Lynn, uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Uh, for a, a dialogue around your book that's coming out, Living a, a Committed Life. And Lynn is a committed life. <laughs> and so is Atosa, so is a Domingo. And anyone through whom the future truly moves, I would say. So thank you uh, all. And we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, bye for now from Humanity Rising. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank Beautiful. You.